Solving general chemistry problems. Thermodynamics. Hermann Hess was a Swiss-Russian chemist and doctor who was an early researcher in chemical thermodynamics. He published a paper in 1840 that claimed that the total energy lost or gained in a series of chemical reactions was the same regardless of the number of steps or path taken. It only depended upon the starting state and the ending state. This was a forerunner of the first law of thermodynamics, and we can now see that it arises from two fundamental principles. One, the conservation of energy, and two, that thermodynamic properties such as enthalpy are functions of state only and not of path, like heat and work are. This is true of all state functions, such as entropy or Gibbs energy, and so the principles and processes involved can be applied to any of them, though in thermochemistry it's most often used for enthalpy. Nowadays we use Hess's law to find the values of some thermodynamic properties of an unknown reaction by combining a series of known reactions in a manner so that the sum gives the unknown reaction. We do this by treating chemical reaction equations like algebraic equations, adding and subtracting components just like we would add and subtract mathematical equations. The thermodynamic properties are treated in the same way. Here is an example. Carbon can combine with oxygen to form carbon monoxide. When it does, it releases 110.5 kilojoules per mole of enthalpy. A reminder, allowing this chemical process to occur in different ways can apportion the enthalpy into heat and work in differing amounts. Heat and work are path dependent, but the enthalpy change is the same in all cases, for enthalpy is a state function. We can also take carbon monoxide and com combine it with some more oxygen to form carbon dioxide. When we do, this process releases 283 kilojoules per mole of enthalpy. The question Hess's law helps us to answer is, what will happen if we combine all the oxygen directly with the carbon and form CO2 straight from the carbon? Hess's law will have us write down the two equations and add them together, treating each component like it was a mathematical entity. Because of this, the two oxygen portions add together, while the two CO portions cancel each other out, being on opposite sides of the equation. The resulting reaction equation describes exactly what we're looking for the combination of oxygen and carbon to form carbon dioxide. Because we added the equations to each other, we also add the enthalpy together. The result is that this reaction can be expected to release 393.5 kilojoules per mole of enthalpy. This is exactly what is found experimentally, and this is Hess's law at work. Here's a common question you could encounter. Using these three reaction equations, combine them to determine the enthalpy change for the fourth reaction. You might call the first three equations your resource equations. They are what you have to work with. The last equation is your target equation. One strategy you might look is to look through your resource equations for the larger, more complex molecules that might occur only once. Position the resource equations so that they place those molecules on the same side as found in the target equation. Liquid hydrazine is the first one. We can write out that resource equation just as is. Hydrogen peroxide is another such molecule. However, there are a couple of things not quite right. The resource equation has it on the product side, but our target equation requires it on the reactant side. No problem. We just reverse that resource equation. The next issue is that the target equation calls for the peroxide to have a coefficient of 2. We can multiply all of the reaction participants by 2. This makes the two large molecules work out. The nitrogen, nitrogen is also in the right place with the right amount, but we see that we will have H2 and O2 still floating around, and also there's not enough liquid water as a product. We use the third equation to balance this out. Use it as given so that it will provide more liquid water on the product side. Also, we will have to multiply by 2 to get enough water. Okay, the four components of the target equation are in place with the right coefficients. What about the H2 and O2? Notice how they nicely cancel out completely. Adding everything together gives the correct target equation. But we wanted to know about the enthalpy change in the reaction. The first equation, the combustion of hydrazine, is written out as given since nothing changed. The second equation was reversed and multiplied by 2. 
When a reaction is reversed, we change the sign of any and all corresponding thermodynamic properties, in this case the enthalpy. And if the equation is scaled by any factor, increased or decreased, we scale the thermodynamic property, the enthalpy in this case, by the same amount. The third equation was scaled, but not reversed. So the enthalpy doubles, but the sign remains the same. Now you can add it all up and obtain the final answer. The reaction of liquid hydrazine with liquid hydrogen peroxide releases 818.2 kilojoules per mole of enthalpy. Look this over carefully and remember the strategy. Find the larger molecules that occur only once and arrange the resource equations to reflect those entities in the target equation. Scale an equation to get the right stoichiometry in the target. Reverse an equation if you need the molecule to change sides, reactants versus products. Combine additional equations to cancel out unnecessary species. The reaction enthalpy is scaled by the same factor as an equation. The sign of the enthalpy is reversed if the equation is reversed. Add the enthalpies just like you added the equations. Now here's a little something of note. You might have had a question about this. In this equation, which is just our target equation in the last problem, what is meant by the per mole in the enthalpy? You will look at the equation and see a stoichiometry of 1 for the hydrazine, 2 for the liquid hydrogen peroxide, 1 for the nitrogen gas, and 4 for the liquid water. Which one of them does the per mole refer to? The answer is none of them. The thermodynamic properties are properties of the reaction not of a substance. That is what the delta implies. It is about the change from reactants to products. When this reaction occurs mole times, then 818 kilojoules per mole of enthalpy is released. The mole is a unit of quantity, just like a dozen, or score, or gross. It is used to measure how many things are present and can be used to count anything. Strictly speaking, one should always specify what the count refers to. However, the identity of the item being counted is often neglected with the assumption that it is clear from context. For instance, as I am going to the grocery store, my wife might shout to me out the window to get two dozen. It is very likely that I would return with two dozen eggs, so they're commonly sold in that unit and I might get into trouble by not bringing home two dozen buns. It shouldn't be my fault because her directive was not clear. It doesn't matter, I'll get into trouble anyway. The situation arises here as well. Many people think that the per mole must be referring to one of the reaction participants and find it confusing in reactions such as these. Some may feel that it's clearer to leave off the per mole. And so you might see them reporting the enthalpy change for this reaction between hydrazine and peroxide as just minus 818.2 kilojoules. They will say that the implication is that the stoichiometric coefficients refer to the quantities measured in moles. But this is not correct. Later, when we discuss thermodynamics, the per mole will prove to be very important mathematically. IUPAC, the International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry, is the international body which recommends chemical usage, rules, nomenclature, and so many things chemical. They recommend that we use delta sub R H naught, where the subscript R reminds us that it is referring to the reaction and not to any specific component. This practice is widely but not universally adopted. Even if it is not used notationally, the enthalpy change still always refers to the reaction equation as written. On occasion, it may be reasonable to ask about the reaction's enthalpy release as a function of one of the components. The stoichiometry tells us how that component relates to the reaction. For instance, for this hydrazine peroxide reaction, while well, delta sub RH naught equals minus 818.2 kilojoules per mole of reaction events, we might also say 818.2 kilojoules of enthalpy is released per mole of hydrogen consumed, or 818.2 kilojoules of enthalpy is released per mole of nitrogen gas produced, or 409.1 kilojoules of enthalpy is released per mole of hydrogen peroxide consumed, or 204.5 kilojoules of enthalpy is released per mole of liquid water produced. Those are all valid questions to ask and answer, but it is important to remember that the reaction 
enthalpy change is delta sub RH naught equals minus 818.2 kilojoules per mole of reaction events. If we were to scale the reaction up or down by changing the stoichiometric coefficients, the enthalpy change would scale with it. If we double the coefficients, then for the reaction as it is now written, would have delta sub RH naught equals minus 1636.4 kilojoules per mole of reaction events as written.